Joining me now to cover all of this is David Gartenstein Ross. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Always great to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. Give me the significance of the U.S. personnel going to Chad. Is this uh, going to make much of a dent, do you think? It's hard to tell at the outset. I mean, I think there's areas where the U.S. contribution will make a difference. One thing that we know is that the U.S. is going to provide uh, aerial surveillance. Uh, the question really is, um, you know, what is the function of the personnel who are going there? Right now, um, I think there's a little bit more speculation as to how they're going to fit into the uh, overall picture than, than uh, there are actual facts, at least publicly available. Is this one of those things where uh, the, the international community feels like they have to do something, so you, you make the pronouncement, you do something, but, but as one of the Pentagon officials was saying, it's a needle in a jungle, so to speak. It, it certainly is. It's an area where I think there's at least a chance of being able to succeed um, in a variety of ways. I mean, number one, I mentioned the surveillance, uh, and uh, surveillance capabilities can provide information that can help to track down the girls, which is very difficult, but I think there's a chance of succeeding. Uh, beyond that, it will actually provide uh, some intelligence on Boko Haram's movements and help uh, the Nigerian government to understand more about the group itself. Uh, there's a, a lot of, of room to help the Nigerian military. It's a military that has had problems uh, with human rights abuses, with professionalism, um, and so that's another aspect in which uh, the international community may try to help. Talk to me about uh, the, the level of violence we saw just yesterday and then again today. Uh, as you look at the landscape, because you understand it, uh, what do you see is more troubling? I, I mean, or is it just this continuation? Well, e everything here is troubling. You've had over a thousand people die in Nigeria already this year at the hands of Boko Haram. It's a, a, a pretty remarkable pace of violence. The thing to me that's um, so interesting and horrifying is how after they kidnapped the schoolgirls and all, all eyes were on Boko Haram, uh, they released a statement that was, um, you know, like it was from a, a crazy person, uh, in, in which, um, you know, Shikau seemed as though he was uh, on drugs uh, and um, said things like, those girls shouldn't have been going to school anyway. And then they, they um, continued violence at the same or a greater pace afterwards. You mentioned the three villages where they just slaughtered people. You had uh, that horrific bombing in Jos. Um, and so it's, it's as though when the eyes of the world are on them, rather than sending any sort of message that normal people anywhere can relate to, uh, they're keeping up this massive pace of killing, uh, such that even uh, al-Qaeda is, is now saying that they're far too extreme. You brought up Joe, and, and uh, this is an area that's been a flashpoint in the past in terms of, of, of violence between Christians and Muslims. Uh, there's a report in The Guardian that there was a mob that uh, picked up some Muslims, beat them. Uh, this is the yes. sort of thing that can escalate, because we've seen that in the past, haven't we? A absolutely. And, and that's the one area where I think that it's clear that Boko Haram is acting strategically. Uh, if you look at, at what they've been doing, the reason why I say that it's so remarkable, their pace of killing, is because a lot of it runs counter to the strategy I would expect from a violent non-state actor uh, that understands what it's doing. Now, uh, there may be some parts of the picture that I'm missing, but that's the area where what they do actually makes sense. If you look at their targeting over the past several years, they've heavily targeted Christians, including there was um, multiple horrifying attacks against churches. And one of the, the reasons for that is exactly what you put your finger on, which is that this is a place where there's been intercommunal violence between Muslims and Christians. And if you look at the history of jihadist groups, they tend to benefit uh, when there are sectarian tensions, with, whether it's Muslim Christian or in Iraq, where you had Shia Sunni clashes, and Al Qaeda in Iraq was able to exploit that back in the 2006 to 07 period. Likewise, I think this is exactly what Boko Haram wants. They want retaliatory attacks against Muslims, which will then help to radicalize some parts of the Muslim population who are attacked by Christians. And Boko Haram would like to insert themselves uh, as being the protector of Muslims. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to succeed, and they have, in fact, killed a whole lot of Muslims as well. But this is the one area where their strategy makes some sort of bloodstained sense. And, it, and it's an area to, to keep our eye on. U.S. Under Secretary of State Sarah Sewell says the situation is complicated, but she believes the Nigerian government is capable of fighting Boko Haram effectively. The people in the country, though, though they don't believe that. I mean, there's, there's been no signs of that. Uh, right. it, why, why the feeling of that? Uh, well, it, there's a, a whole question as to what she actually means by they're capable of doing it effectively. I mean, if, if you look at it um, compared to any standard of what Americans would expect uh, or even Nigerians would expect as, as effective, no, they're not effective. Uh, but I think what she's putting um, her finger on is that the U.S. wants to curtail its involvement. We don't want Boko Haram to become our problem in, in terms of, of the U.S. being the lead. Because if you look at the Obama strategy over the past three or four years, uh, one of the key things that they've done 
is tailored back U.S. resource commitments, um, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, what, what, if you look at Libya, the um, phrase leading from behind, which an official spoke, and to some extent I think the administration views that as a curse. But what, what it's speaking to is the U.S. wasn't in the lead in the Libya operation. You know, it was one where the U.S. did a, a lot of the lifting, but if you compare the Libya intervention to the Kosovo intervention in the 1990s, the U.S. wasn't the primary actor who uh, everyone depended on and was doing 90% or so of the work. Instead, other countries were able to step up. And likewise, we want uh, countries in regions where the regions are primarily hit to be those who are at the forefront. I think that's what this statement is speaking to. All right, David, uh, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming in. Certainly uh, appreciate your insights.